You're listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Yelp Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Yelp will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven, Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. We are talking to Dr. Daniel Levitin, who's a professor of psychology, behavioral neuroscience, and music at McGill University in Montreal. Dan, it's a pleasure to have you. Oh, thanks for having me, Doug. So uh, the reason I wanted to talk to you really was about music, because in a former life, I was a musician, and then I turned to business. And a lot of what you've written has been about not music per se, but just about how music affects people. So could you just talk about how you discovered that? Well, I, it, uh, I guess it goes back to when I was an engineer and a producer in California in the 1980s, and I was working in a recording studio, and there was one particular day where Carlos Santana was playing a guitar solo, and I started to get goosebumps. <laughs> and I, I don't mean to imply that that's the only day I got goosebumps listening to him play. That happened all the time. But this one particular day, it just occurred to me to ask the question, why is this happening? Why am I having such a physical, bodily reaction to somebody uh, banging on guitar strings? And um, I began to take classes in neuroscience, to understand the brain and the body's reactions to, to external stimuli. And one thing led to another, and I, I now run a laboratory, and that's basically what we do is try to understand emotional and cognitive reactions to music. So you play either very good music or very bad music for people and see how, they, <laughs> how their skin <laughs> shrivels? Yeah, we, and we play music that a lot of people um, have already listened to and could, would consider happy, canonically happy music or sad music or scary music, and we look at physical reactions in the body, we look at brain reactions using brain scanning technology, and of course we just ask people what they're feeling, a, a, a tried and true psychological method. And does it cut across different cultures? Well, now that's an interesting thing. Here um, in North America, of course, um, music is somewhat homogeneous in the Western tradition. Um, there in Israel, you have the benefit of of Western music, but also Middle Eastern music. Uh, what someone raised here who's been pretty insulated and only heard Western music, whether it's classical or pop or jazz, what they tend to think of is that major chords are happy and minor chords are sad. Mm -hmm. And then I always have to point out, well, you know, if you listen to Middle Eastern music or klezmer music, it's almost all in minor keys, but it isn't all sad. So this major-minor distinction is entirely cultural and entirely learned. That's interesting. We have a lot of guests at our house from other countries. That, you know, there are these lost tribes of Jews, and one of them is the uh, lost tribe that went to China a couple of thousand years ago. They now live in the city of Kaifeng, and several of them are, are living and learning in a yeshiva near my house, and we're friends with them, and they come over. And one of the things that's very interesting is they teach us... Are you sure the tribe was lost, and they didn't did just <laughs> want to get closer to the source of Chinese food? <laughs> did, did you see me? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, these guys are fabulous cooks, by the way. You should uh, stop by and try. They, uh, <laughs> their mothers are very proud. Yeah. But one of the interesting things that I've noticed, and uh, I hope they're not listening to this recording, is that when we sing around the Shabbat table, they are the most out of key of anyone. And I well, out of, key to, to your, yeah. out of key to your ears. That's what I was going to say, that they, are, they don't hear the melodies that we are singing. They hear other melodies. Right. They have a different scale system in Chinese music. And so what's out of key for them and what's out of key for us are different things. And that also is culturally determined. Um, it's, it's interesting to compare our auditory sense with our visual sense for this purpose. So when we look at a rainbow, all of us, unless we've got a physiological problem, see the same colors. We see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet, and uh, we can look at Pantone chips or other color samples, and this is more or less determined by the physiology and the chemical sense of the eye. Um, on the other hand, there, and this goes across culture is what I mean about color. Mm -hmm. There is no cross-cultural universality for pitches of the infinity of tones that are available to use 
different cultures have selected a subset that they call their scale. And the auditory system isn't chemically based. It's based on vibrations uh, which are continuous in nature and not discrete. And as a, as a result of all that, people can choose any pitches they want and, and make their own scale. There's no biological imperative to choose a particular one. So therefore, someone in China who grew up in China with Chinese music might not find klezmer music happy? And they might not find it interpretable either. They might not know what the heck is going on. The other interesting thing there is that um, in spite of the fact that all these different cultures choose their own pitches, there are still cultural universals, such as the octave. Virtually every musical system we've looked at, thousands of them, all have the octave and they all have the perfect fifth. But then how they divide up the scale after that is, is culturally specific. Well, that's interesting. Okay, we are talking to Dr. Daniel Levitin, who is a professor of psychology. He's also the author of two best-selling books. One of them is called This Is Your Brain on Music, The Science of Human Obsession. The other one is called The World in Six Songs, How the Musical Brain Created Human Nature. So let's talk about using music as a way of controlling your emotions. One of the, the peop things that people often tell me they say, Doug, you're on Wall Street, even though you sit in Israel. It must be very, very stressful. How do you relax? Do you listen to music? So as a musician, I happen to like music. But how does it help people to, it, well, let's start, does it help people to relax? And can it help them to become stronger, to regenerate themselves? Well, what we find is that um, many, many people use music for mood regulation and self-regulation. Uh, not that different from the way we use certain drugs. We use caffeine to get going. We use alcohol to relax. Uh, and people use music in the same way. Uh, there's a certain kind of music that people know will help uh, get them through an exercise workout. And that's not the same kind of music they would use to calm themselves down. Now, uh, there is no one piece of music that everybody finds suitable for any of these activities. It's a very personal choice, right? There's probably a music that you know you want to reach for when you've had a bad day and you just need to feel centered again, right? Absolutely. So uh, the question that you raise then is how does this work? Well, um, one, of the things, one of the things that's going on is that our neurons, the nerve cells in our brain, fire synchronously, that is in time, with the beat of the music. So you can see that um, something of a high tempo, a rousing music like a march that could get your neurons firing a little bit faster than they already are is going to get your whole body going. And that's going to help you with a marathon or with a sprint or just to get out of bed. Uh, music that's soothing tends to have a slower tempo. Now there's more to it than just tempo and synchronous neural firing, but that's a part of it. The other big part of it is that um, music is somehow uniquely able to access the emotional centers of our brain. And this causes a release of certain neurochemicals. So we've now seen a great deal of evidence that when people listen to music they like, regardless of whether it's fast or slow or happy or sad, just music they like, that they find pleasurable, dopamine is released. This is the so-called feel-good hormone. And it washes over the brain, and it allows people to feel this sense of pleasure and, and happiness. So would you suggest that people keep music on in the background that they like throughout the day? It's not as clear that the benefits come from music when it's in the background. It's, what we've seen is that it comes from focused listening. I'm not aware of any studies that show that background music has the same effect. I'm not saying it doesn't. I just don't know about any studies that show it. So are there practical implications that you can derive from this? Well, right now we're at the early stages of the research. Uh, I mean, one practical thing, it might be music therapy. We're beginning to see that um, music that's pleasurable to the listener and that's chosen by the listener, not imposed on the listener, can affect things like pain thresholds and recovery times in the operating room and really can help with overall mood. People who listen to music report that uh, they maintain more stable moods. Let me just switch directions a little bit as this is a finance show. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the business of music. You, Before you were a, a professor in this field, you were involved in the music industry. 
Could you talk about how it's changed and where we're heading? Well, in, when I was in the music industry, uh, there were 16 to 20 major record labels in, in Europe and North America, and now there are three. And um, all of them are struggling, of course, and have been for many, many years. I think that um, one of the biggest shifts, and this is perhaps obvious to your listeners, is that virtually every recording ever made is available on the Internet somewhere. And it's there for free if you just look mm -hmm. hard enough. And I'm not just talking about hit records by Michael Jackson or Adele or Lady Gaga or the Rolling Stones. I'm talking about um, field recordings from um, Kazakhstan or the Ural <laughs> Mountains and you know, um, the music of the Cameroon Pygmies. I mean, all of this stuff is there. And if it's there for free, the problem is um, it's not being monetized. And the hundred year history we have of an industry built around uh, nurturing, supporting, and promoting artists is crumbling. Uh, on the one hand, this is a golden age for music. There are more people making music and distributing it and listening to it than ever before. The average 14-year-old today is going to hear more songs, at least going to have more songs on a handheld device than our great-grandfather would have heard in his lifetime. <laughs> right? So, I mean, when I say it's a golden age, we're at a unique nexus in history where listeners can really find the music that they like. They don't have to settle for music that's just okay. They can find exactly the music they like. You've probably talked on your program about the long tail. Exactly. Uh, and that's what this is, right? I mean, there can be a band that's making music that only 10,000 people in the world like, but it could be the favorite music of those 10,000 people. And that band and those listeners can get together and have this mutually supportive relationship that can be wonderful, whereas 20 years ago that would have been possible. Uh, impossible to find the record, impossible for the record to be distributed, and so on. The struggle that the industry is facing as I alluded to, is how to monetize all this. And um, I think the, the first hurdle we face is that there's now an entire generation of listeners, virtually everyone under the age of 25, who's only known... The Internet? Uh, <coughs> right. And they've mm -hmm. only known uh, a model where music was free. Mm -hmm. And they don't think they ought to pay for it. They don't see any reason why they should. Is that the same way uh, that we listen to radio growing up? You turn on the radio, you listen. You never paid for it. Well, that's right. Oh, you do now. You pay for it in your car if you've got Sirius or XM, at least in the, yeah. in the States. So there, there are precedents for shifting to a paid model when something was free. Uh, we saw this in television. It used to be you'd stick rabbit ears on your set or an aerial on top of your house. Now most people um, in the West pay for television through cable. Mm -hmm. uh, we pay for water. Water used to be free, but bottled water is a billion dollar industry, right? So if we want people to pay for music, we have to give them something of value. And I think what that's going to be is, is twofold. First, it's becoming more and more difficult to find the music you want because there's so much out there. But se second, it's becoming more and more difficult once you've built up a library of your own music, it's, it becomes difficult to decide what to play. Most people don't bother anymore. They just stick their device into shuffle mode, random mode, because it's too much trouble. As my grandmother used to say, too much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's just too much trouble to try to figure out what do I feel like hearing. I've got 20,000 songs. Where do I begin to try and dial this, turn this, and you know, select that? It, nobody goes to that trouble. That's what DJs so, were good for. Well, that's right. And so I think you've nailed it. I think the future of music is that um, either some software or DJs are going to rise in importance, and they'll provide us playlists of music that we like that's keyed to the time of day that we're listening to it, wake-up music versus work music versus relaxing music. And we, we, you know, we might pay $5 a month or something like that in order to have uh, to relinquish a little bit of control and get some, a better playlist than we can get in random mode. Mm -hmm. it's, an, it's an interesting direction that we see the, the business going in. And it all is also 
some people see it as a democratization in the same way that the book industry is changing and that the big publishers are no longer giving huge advances and they're not distributing books because it's so much easier just to do it as an e-book and give everyone the opportunity both to be an author and to buy books that might otherwise not be found. Yes, and a democratization, I think that's important. The, the barriers to entry uh, 20 years ago were huge. You had to have access to a million dollar recording studio. You had to have access to at least a six figure um, promotional budget. You had to make a video for MTV. Now anybody with a laptop can make an album that sounds as good as <laughs> Beggar's Banquet by the Stones, and they can put it on the internet for free. And you know, the electrons move around for free, and, and so it's a green technology. It is a great democratizing force. And speaking of those inter internet um, electrons moving around, I think another um, alternative model for monetizing music, all the IS are tracking traffic. They know when a music file is being sent from one uh, internet user to another. And they even know what it is because the file contains tags. They've been very reluctant to share this information with governments. But it would be a relatively simple matter to just decide as a society, A, we think that the, the job of artist should be um, an actual job classification. And people who are artists deserve to earn a living by being artists. B, <laughs> we want to compensate them uh, in proportion to how much their work is appreciated. And so C, we impose some kind of a tax, uh, the proceeds of which would be collected by the Internet service providers, the ISPs, mm -hmm. and then distributed proportionally to artists. And maybe you charge a tenth of a cent per song. It doesn't have to be a lot of money. Because the number of downloads um, is so huge. Uh, I calculated five years ago that if you were to tax the exchange of um, MP3 files on the Internet only a tenth of a cent, the artists uh, would be earning as much as they earn currently on sales of CDs and records and other artifacts. Wow. Well, that's amazing. Amazing, truly. We have been talking to Dr. Daniel Levitin, who is a professor of psychology and neuroscience, and he's also a, got a great background in music. We're just about out of time. And, and uh, Dan, I just want to ask, how can people follow the work that you're doing? Ah, people can go to my website. It's daniellevitin.com, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E-V-I-T-I-N.com, and We've got a Facebook community and a Twitter community there. You can follow me at Twitter. I'm at Dan Levitin. Uh, the Twitter handle is, is Dan Levitin. The website is Daniel Levitin. The website has also all of uh, the research articles from my lab and a number of um, videos. Oh, fabulous. Okay, I, I'm, just, I'm afraid we're just out of time, but uh, Dan, thank you very, very much for your time. I hope I'll have a chance to speak to you again soon and maybe to see you in Israel as well. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.